Okay, welcome back to Discipleship Training. We are still talking about the framework of discipleship. Uh, and we've been, we started now talking about intimacy, right? In terms of how does that intimacy look with God? Because he is not here physically. He dwells in on the inside. His presence is always here and can be felt. But he himself is not here in the flesh. So our typical process of physical intimacy in, in a relationship, friendship, with family consists of, you know, hugs, handshakes, uh, kisses on the cheeks, high fives, whatever. Can't do that with God right now. So we have to look at what is his prescribed way of being physically intimate with him as our father, as the head of our life and our savior. And so what we started with talking about praise, which is to exalt and boast of him, his works and all his blessings in our life. Praising God is complimenting him. Um, and so let's start in the New King James Version. And we're going to go to Psalm 71 verse 8. Um, and this is where we left off last week. And we'll continue to look at physical intimacy with God. And the point I touched on last week was we, when it comes to being in a friendship or, or a relationship, it is our duty to interact with that person in the way they deem appropriate. We can't tell a person how they want to be intimate with, right? So if they say, I only like handshakes, I'm really not a big hugger, you can't just be walking up on hugging them, right? That's, that's disrespectful, it's inconsiderate, because you have to go the way in which they say, this is, this is how I want you to interact with me and our relationship. It's the same thing with God. We can't just take anything to him and call that intimacy. Uh, so that's why we're starting to go down, we've been going down this and we're looking at praise. So in the New King James Version, in Psalm 71 verse 8, it reads, let my mouth be filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. So what we talked about last week is that praise is auditory. So it is not just a thought or a feeling. To praise God is to speak highly of him. Now, that can come through prayer, which we know is conversation. And you, and you are praising him. It can come through you just complimenting him. It can come through the singing of songs, the writing of, the speaking of poems. There are multiple ways in which you can praise God, but it has to be with your mouth. You can also add in instruments. You can clap your hands. You can play the piano. You know, if God has blessed you with musical talents. All of that is an instrument. It is a tool, but praise is in the mouth. So even if you play, pray the, uh, play the most beautiful inspirational melody, but you never open your mouth, you have not praised God. And so that's what we really have to understand is to compliment God is to speak. It's the same thing. You can't say, oh, I'm giving you a compliment. Well, I didn't hear you say anything. I, I thought it. You know my thoughts. <laughs> you know what's in my head. You know how I feel about you. Right? No, you have, to, you have to speak that. You have to say it. And it's the same thing with praise. So as we look at this scripture, the writer said, like, my mouth is filled with your praise he's talking about words everything that you have done that is what I'm filling my mouth with when I'm complimenting you I'm praising your works I am boasting of you your strength, your capability your ability, your faithfulness your trustworthiness that is what we're talking about so when we praise God we have to make sure that we are doing it through the means in which he has outlined you're opening your mouth you're saying words. And like I said, those words can come through a song, a poem, a, a speech, a statement, a book you're reading out loud that you wrote about them. But you have to be saying something. Okay? Any thoughts, questions, or comments there before, before we start to move forward? Alright, so the reason why now that we praise him and compliment him and boast of him, first being because he is worthy of it. So let's go to, so we're staying in the New King James Version, and we're staying in Psalm, and we're going to go to the uh, one, Psalm 145, verse 3. So Psalm 145, verse 3, in the New King James Version. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. So starting off the bat, God is great. And because of that, 
he is greatly to be praised. It is due to him. He is worthy of it. He has earned it. It is his right. So when we boast of someone, when we compliment them, logically, <laughs> right, if you, if, you, if you track that out, it's because they've done something worthy of praise. They've done something that is to be complimented. Very rarely, I'm not saying it never happens, but it doesn't make sense to praise someone who is not praiseworthy. Right? That did logically that doesn't track. How am I complimenting me in, in saying you and praising you, but you're a terrible human being? <laughs> right? It doesn't make sense. So from from God's perspective, and when we're talking about praise, it is and this is the thing where, it, where we're talking about building that relationship, right? We're talking about intimacy. It should be easy to praise God. Because there is no one that is alive, quite frankly. And I mean, if you want to talk into the spiritual realm of it, there's no one who's, never, who's ever died who has not experienced the greatness of God. Now, we can have a conversation about did that greatness lead them to repentance? But once again, that's an individual decision. That does not make God not great. Everyone has experienced the greatness of God. And it could be as simple as you woke up this morning and was and were able to take a deep breath to as complicated as he got you out of a situation that you thought you would never be able to get out and no one was able to help you. It doesn't matter on the spectrum. It is all great. Because this is what I love about God, and this is why he is so worthy of praise, is the things that we take for granted, the simple things, we really don't realize how complicated it actually is. I was um, listening to a video, or watching a video, probably a couple weeks back. And it was this disabled person who has not had the ability to walk since birth. They have never experienced what it is to walk. And they're a... Um, PhD or something in, in, in biochemistry, pretty much what they're trying to do is solve natural paralysis, right? So all they do is study how the body works intimately, right? Like what in the brain triggers the nerves in the spine, which then trigger the nerves in your legs, which trigger the muscles to get you to walk. And what he's saying is, because they're trying to solve to fix that, that's why he's studying that. Because he's like, the answer is in that, that neural connection. For him, when he was born, and now we know spiritually there, there's a, a lot more things considered, right? But we're just talking from a scientific perspective, from his worldview. Something in that connection is not working. So that's what he's solving for. But as he was explaining it, he was like, what people who are able to walk take for granted is because it's so simple for them. But they don't understand the number of triggers from the brain to your spine, to the nervous system, to your legs, to the muscle in your legs that enables you to do what is so in the minds of people who can walk is something that they would have never considered that is difficult to do. And so for this, this, this doctor who is in a wheelchair, who has been in a wheelchair his entire life, I think he said he was like 47 or 48, half a century of not being able to walk, knowing from his, once again, his scientific perspective, if I could just fix that, that kink in the chain, I'll be able to walk. But because of that, it has given him so much more greater insight and appreciation for the process. Whereas everyone in this room, and, and to my knowledge, everyone who is tuned in, in virtually, we do not give a thought to, let me get up and go get myself something to drink. <laughs> it's not a question of the complexity from the design that God has put on each and every one of our bodies that it just works. So when we're talking about greatness, it doesn't even have to be in our, from our very, uh, you know, worldly, temporal perspective, where when we say, like, someone has done great, we think of miracles, we think of the impossible. When we call someone, even though the term has been watered down lately, but when we call someone a hero, right, it's they have done the unimaginable, the selfless act of doing something that no one else could do. 
But from, from God's perspective and how we should view him, he makes the complicated simple in our life. The, be, the ability to walk, to hear, to speak, to see, to taste, to smell. All of these things that we on an individual basis take for granted every single day because in our minds it just works. But this is why God is great because even in the just the design and function of everyday life, you are experiencing something that from a scientist's perspective is extremely complicated. And if you study out what scientists believe on, and on evolution, they don't even un- really fully grasp it. For the most part, most scientists hold the theory that we are all here by accident. That it was the convolution of a multiplicity of random events and somehow the chemistry worked. <laughs> well, as we know, as, though, uh, as, as saints of God, as disciples, that it was intentionally designed and created by him. From the science community's perspective, those who hold true to what they believe is the closest thing that gave birth to life is the, the Big Bang Theory, the explosion. It was a random occurrence of events that led to the first living creature. Think about that, right? Something that we take for granted and people are giving praise to being seriously randomness. <laughs> like going in your kitchen... Throwing in a bunch of ingredients into a pot and coming out with a three-star dish and being like, ah, dog, <laughs> that was by accident. <laughs> but in our minds, once again, we don't look at the fact that every single one of us, when we wake up and experience life, take a breath, be able to walk, see, hear, taste, smell, touch, all of these different things. From the world's perspective, we are experiencing a miracle on a daily basis because from what their finite understanding of creation being contributed to random events, it should not have happened. Think about that. That is why God is great. Even though the world won't give him credit, that intentional design must have an intentional designer. Still, from the world's perspective, to wake up and be able to take a breath from their perspective, I want to make sure I'm reiterating it, from their perspective, happened by accident. That in and of itself, from the world's perspective, is a miracle. So God is great, and he is greatly to be praised. And so if you, and this is why it's so important to have an intimate relationship with him, because if you, quite frankly, are struggling to find something to give God praise for, that's a you problem. And you aren't thinking, you're taking the simple things, the small things, for granted. And I believe now that we are, we are headed which we've been for uh, probably the past few decades, into uh, an experience, into a world, into a position where even the, the little things of being able to pay your bills on time, to have a roof over your head, to have food in your fridge, is becoming increasingly more difficult for more people. Gone are the days of if you were living paycheck to paycheck or didn't have consistent food, we could just call you a bum and you're not working hard enough. It was wrong then, but it's definitely wrong now. It may not be. For those few examples where a person may have been a bum, right? But I'm talking about the larger society as a whole, where inflation on groceries is up 37% year over year, where a carton of eggs used to be three fifty and is now closer to $6. And for a person who's making $16, $17, $18 an hour, we're talking about a, nearly a third of their hourly wage, Right? So it, it, is, it is these things that we give God praise for. So that's why I said, from an intimacy perspective, if you are struggling with, like, there's nothing that I can praise God for today, you ain't, you're really making, you're thinking too deep. Because <laughs> you're thinking about the miracles. You're thinking about the, the, the exception of what we're talking about, the, the, the peaks and the valleys and not the everyday that really is truly the men- the mundane, the normal, the average relationship of just living and walking with God, there's a ton to be grateful for just because you haven't had a miracle experience, a milestone experience yet. Thoughts there before we go to the next verse. It's interesting that you say that because, um, as you know, Donovan, but everybody else will know, the chiropractor that we go to um, is Daddy. a Christian-based um, chiropractor. Mm and a chiropractic care. Um, and one of the things that they hone in on every single day is what is it that you can give God praise for? 
um, when you sit down on the um, on the what is it called? The table. The table. <laughs> um, because to them, even when I'm not gonna lie, like I have a thousand things going on in my head, and I go there, um, and I'm stuttering, and I don't have anything in a sense because I'm like thinking of my to-do list essentially. They're like, well, you need to stop. You need to think about it because there's so much to be grateful for. It could be as small as breath in your lungs, being able to walk, the birth soon of your third baby. So it's just interesting that you said that because it's like people don't often do that. And I love that they force you to just stop and think about that because, like I said, I had a thousand things going on. It was like, well, you need to stop and give God praise for something. Like, there has to be something. And I was like, you're absolutely right. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, and it's funny how difficult of a question it is. And, and, and being and complete, he asks it every day. Every single day <laughs> that you go. And being completely transparent, right? Like, listening to other people and even myself. Like, they literally just come in. And, they don't say hello. No, they don't no. say hi. They say, tell me something good. And the pauses you hear, because it should, to what we were just talking about, it should come natural. It should be so easy. It should be so simple. And most people have to stop and say, let me put aside everything that has gone wrong today. Yeah. Everything that I'm frustrated about, the stresses of life, whether positive or negative stress, because there is a such thing as you stress, positive stress, right? Just, you know, I got a new job, I got a promotion. But you're not thinking about the fact you got a new job, you got a promotion. You're thinking about this came from new responsibilities and new things that I got to learn and new skills that I got to build and it's overwhelming and I'm tired. And just so many, they this, it literally it takes everyone on average like 60 seconds. Because they got to be like, let me dump all of this other stuff and look for, and this is the mistake we all make, the miraculous to say yeah. it is good. Where literally you could just say every day, I woke up this morning. That's good. <laughs> if nothing else went right today, I know somebody that didn't experience that. And that in and of itself is a blessing. And we have to really get outside of where... I'm trying to balance this. So, we are to have expectation of our relationship with the Lord. As long as we are obeying what His Word says. But that expectation can't lead to indifference in taking things for granted. What do I mean by that? When I wake up in the morning, I have an expectation that I'm protected by God because I'm living out his word and there's a hedge of protection that comes for that. Like my expectation is not like, whoo, made it through another night. <laughs> That is not my expectation. But that does not mean I can then become indifferent to the fact that I did wake up this morning. Because even though God has given us expectation, if you follow my word, you can expect this of me. This is my duty to you. This is what I am obligated to do based on my promises and my word. As long as you follow out what I'm telling you to do, this is the expectation. It is still by his grace. It is still by his power. It is still by his faithfulness that unlike us, he doesn't go back on his word. Because we know we can all point to probably examples in our life where someone told us, a human being told us the same thing. Well, if you do this, I got you. Well, I did what you said. I can't come through with it right now. <laughs> God's not like that. And that in and of itself is also a blessing. Reliability and faithfulness is a blessing. Lord, I am so glad that you ain't like I am. Because I know I've made promises to the Lord. Lord, if you get me out of this one, <laughs> I promise I will be in church on Sunday. I promise I'll stop hanging out with those people. I promise I'll stop doing X, Y, and Z. And he says, okay, even though I know you're lying, because once again, we can't pull a fast one on him. I know you're lying. I'm still going to do it. And then we'd be like, all right, I'll see you at the next one. <laughs> nice. So that reliability and that faithfulness in and of itself is a blessing. And that's why I said, like, it really is... When, when, when looking at Psalm 145 and 3, great is the Lord. That rationale behind that, it ain't got to be complicated. It doesn't have to be miraculous. It doesn't have to be like, you know, I, I didn't have a leg and he blessed and he literally manifested another leg for me. That is awesome. But that great ain't just talking about that. It's talking about the simple things we take for granted. 
Um, okay, so let's stay in the New King James Version and let's go to Psalm 104. So in the New King James Version, in Psalm 104, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and to and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. So what the scripture is talking about is still talking about the worthiness of when you come before the presence of God. Whether it, and we can take this and, and apply it, right? Because this is talking about specifically the temple and the way it was just set up. But we can, we can apply this to our lives. When, that means when you go to church, when you go into prayer, when you're in his presence, when you're walking out your house, wherever you're going belongs to the Lord. You should have thanksgiving and praise on your mind and that coming out of your mouth. It is, it is, a, it is a lifestyle. It is a consistent status of being that when I come before the Lord, I am coming with thanksgiving. I am coming with praise. I am thankful. I am appreciative because he is simply worthy of it. And here's the thing. Like even, let's just say you just have a brain fart and you just forgot for that moment what the Lord has done for you. You can be thankful to him for what he's done for other people. And I don't think there's enough of that in the body of Christ. I might not be where I want to be right now, but my friends are. And I'm grateful for that. Because what does it mean? One, it shows me that you care about the people I care about. Because I'm seeing them prosper and I want to see that. Two, it gives me hope. Because if I know if you can do it for them, there's nothing stopping you, you from doing it for me. So it may not have happened yet. But that gives me a hope. That gives me an expectation that it, that it will. So in the rare event where you're just like, Lord, I just can't think of nothing today. Start going down. Well, my mama got this. My friend did this. My, my brother was in this situation. He got it. There is so much to be thankful for. And if you can't think about anybody in your family, think about your community. There wasn't a shooting today. That Someone didn't die. There were the kids that live on my block all made it home last night. This is why I'm saying like it has to become a lifestyle thing. Because there is so much to be grateful for. And it really comes into having intimacy in your relationship with God. Because the world, everything mainly that we consume, is based in the negative abstract. The world is going to hell in a handbasket. There is nothing but drugs and crime and violence on the street. Wars are breaking out. All of this is true. But that ain't the only thing that's going on. And that's what the world wants you to focus on. Because if you're thinking about everything that has gone wrong, everything that has gone bad, everything that hasn't happened yet, you know what you're not thinking about? The things God is worthy to be praised of. Because for me, and this might sound bad, but I'm going to say it. I see something on the news. It could be negative. I see something pop up in my news feed. My first thought is, Lord, have mercy. Praying for that that situation. You know what my next thought is? God, I'm so glad that ain't my life. I'm gonna just be I'm be real. Because no matter how you think about your life, there is someone who always has it worst off. And nowadays, that's not an that's not an abstract conversation. <laughs> it is because of social media, because we are so interconnected, you know people who are in a worse situation than you are. And so for you to be able to sit and be like, Lord, I don't have nothing to praise you for. I can't, I can't think of Thanksgiving. I can't think of things that I should be grateful for. Be grateful for the things that have not happened in your life. Be appreciative of the things that haven't occurred. The, the things that God has protected you from that you will never even know was a threat to you. It was so interesting because when we were living in Chicago, me and Ephateria, and the church we were going to at the time... We went on a financial fast. And pretty much the point of the financial fast in conjunction with regular fasting was you don't spend no money for, I think it went for 40 days. And then I think during each week, there were like two to three days of absolute fasting. Not like back to back, but it was like Monday, Wednesday, Friday. There was like a schedule, right? 
And what the, the purpose of it was for was one, to help people pay off debt. Because a lot of people don't realize, like, if you just stop spending certainly not everything, right? But they were just like, there's more money available to you than you know. Because you, you haven't taken the time to just stop swiping and actually pay attention to where your money's going. That was one goal of it. The second goal of it, though, which I thought was even more impactful and powerful, was to actually get a correct understanding of tithing. Not in the sense of whether you should do it or not. Not in the sense of whether it's supposed to be 10%. It wasn't talking about the, 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 the moral obligation of tithing. It was talking about understanding that the benefits of tithing go far beyond what we think is just a financial return. Well, I tithe 10%, I'm expecting 40% back. Right? I, I give my $1,000, I expect a $15,000 bonus or increase. Right? No. What the focus was is to really get into understanding where it talks about uh, the canker worm and the lotus and all of these things where, that bring famine, that bring lack, that bring disease. We can attribute that to so many things in our life. Right? A lack of funds or the type of money you want to be making is not the only threat <laughs> to your financial security. Right? War, community poverty and violence, the sickness, sickness in your family, the, the wrong step that causes an injury. All of these things are threats to your financial health. That is what when scripture is talking about the canker worm and the locust, it is talking about everything that can potentially come to steal your harvest. And tithing is what you are sowing into that. You are sowing in to the protection that God has said. If you tithe consistently and you obey my word, you will not experience famine. Famine does not just necessarily mean you ain't going to have money in your pocket. And so it gave me a really good perspective when looking at my tithing and praying over my tithe is I'm not just praying for job security. I'm not just grateful for job security. Like, Lord, I'm thankful for the things that I have not even seen that I know that my consistent tithing and my relationship with you, based on what you said, right, going back to that expectation, I know there are some things that just went by our household that the Lord will never reveal to me that you don't even know what I've protected you from. So when we're talking about praise, because he is worthy of praise, there's just so much. There's literally so much that in a given day, you really just don't know what the Lord has done for you. What could have happened but didn't happen. What the situation you put it yourself in, how it could have gone but didn't go. That you would, because we are not omnipresent as he is living outside of time, we don't get that perspective. We live in terms of time in a linear fashion. What happens, happens. I don't get to see all the other scenarios in which this could have played out (laughs) because of my bad decision, because of the place that I put myself in, or just because Satan is out here looking to whom he can devour. And he wanted to bring something to my doorstep, and the Lord said, not so. That is something to be grateful for. So when we're talking about coming to his presence, his gates, with thanksgiving, with a praise on our mind and on our lips, it should not be hard. It should not be difficult. Because if it, once again, if you can't think of something for yourself, you can definitely think of something for someone else, for your community, for your state, for your region, for your country at large. Trust me, you're not grasping at straws. If you, if you, you don't have to look hard to be like, Lord, thank you. Just turn on the news. <laughs> Literally, just turn on the news. And all you have to say, every time you see something, Lord, thank you that that didn't happen to my children. Lord, thank you that that didn't happen to my family. Lord, thank you that that didn't happen to my community. It's not hard. All right, so let's go to the English Standard Version. So ESV. And we're going to read Psalm 150, verse 6. So in the English Standard Version, Psalm 150, verse 6. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So, 
and we're going to get to, you know, I don't know if we'll get to today, but we, we're going to get to when we start talking about worship. But praise is for everybody, which is why I said there is nobody who has ever lived or who, or who will ever live who does not have something to praise God for. It doesn't matter if you are a straight heathen <laughs> and you have no desire to have a relationship with the Lord. There is still an expectation because God is still like, you still here, brother, sister. I have not. <laughs> I have not struck down judgment on your life. That's something to be thankful for. So everything, every single thing that has breath, and there's even the scriptures that we talk about, like even creation in the sense of animals, understand this concept. <laughs> that the world in and of itself does not exist without the word of God. That is something to be grateful for. Because the moment, and I don't think a lot of people realize this, it will never happen, but it is still a factual statement. If God, which will never happen, stop being who he is, the world ceases to exist. No one has that level of importance in anybody's life. <laughs> to where if we stop being who we are, it might be a struggle. It might be a little hard. But eventually you will adapt. You will adjust. You will get through it. Right? That ain't the case with God. God stopped being God. We stop to exist. <laughs> there's no adapting. There's no adjusting. The world literally ceases. Because the world only consists and exists because it is established on God's word. So that's why everything has an obligation and an expectation of praise. Doesn't matter if you love God or not. <laughs> you still have experienced the greatness of God. And so because of that, that is why he is worthy. Because there is, as human beings, we're not nice to people most, in most time. We're not nice to, be, nice to people in general. We're specifically, we're not very kind or nice to people who are n not nice and kind to us. You know, we're very petty in that regard. Well, they're going to be rude to me. I'm going to give it right back to them. I'm going to keep that same energy, right? We have all these statements. <laughs> but that is not God. That is another reason why he is so great because he is not petty. He is not put to the whims and controlled by emotional responses to things. Because if he was, uh, the world would have been destroyed permanently <laughs> a long time ago. I'm done with y'all. It's over. I'm not doing this no more. I'm starting from scratch. <laughs> now, we know he did that with the flood, but he still kept the world, and he saved a remnant of people who were obedient to him. If we were in the same position, the earth would no longer exist, because we, I'm not... Why? From a humanistic perspective, like I said, we're not even kind in the best of situations. You're telling me that without the Holy Spirit, your carnal mind, your evil nature, somebody spits in your face on a daily basis, you're going to be kind and loving and turn the other cheek towards them? Bull crap. <laughs> Straight up lie. So that's why everything that has breath has a reason to praise God because he is worthy of it. Because really, regardless of where we stand with him, we have still experienced the grace of God. Every day that a sinner gets another day in sin for an opportunity to repent is experiencing the greatness and grace of God. Every single day. Every single day that you are living contrary to the word of God and there is another opportunity for repent repentance. You are experiencing the grace and greatness of God. Now, that doesn't mean that that's endless. That doesn't mean that... You just gonna can you can continue to do whatever you want to do, right? We know through scripture there are expectations on God, on us from God. But it, still, to get even if it is only a second chance, to get a second chance from God is experiencing His greatness and His grace. I think one of the important things about praise is that it's birthed from a place of appreciation, mm -hmm. and so even though like a sinner or heathen has experienced great things from God or good things from God, they, if they don't appreciate it, then you're not going to stop to give them praise. And so just thinking about just even small things to give praise for, like I was out throughout the day yesterday just 
doing a bunch of stuff and so at one point it was just really beautiful you look up in the sky just so blue full of clouds and i just gave god like god this is a beautiful day thank you and then at some point when i was out it started to rain but i saw a rainbow like and it's been a while since i saw a rainbow and i was like oh my god there's a rainbow in the sky and i was like thank you god because i have an appreciation and i said you'll never flood the earth again i know what that rainbow means not only is it beautiful but it also has a meaning it's a sign to every human being that god said i will never flood the earth again um so just even giving him thanks for that like just seeing that rainbow um it was awesome so yeah, it's just really learning how to just, throughout your day, find the small things to be appreciative of. There's a commercial that keeps coming on when I watch YouTube. Um, and younger people don't understand this, older people do. Um, so one, he didn't make this, okay, let me make a comment that I normally make and then I'll make the comment that he made. If you can go through life and forget that you have a body, you need to give God praise. That means you you don't feel no pain in your body. You're not experiencing any complications. It's, you really become aware that you have a body when you start to get those aches and pains and mm -hmm. like, oh man. So he, I don't know what's wrong with him. He's really sick or something like that. And he said that um, every day that he like lives and wakes up because he can't go up the steps. He, he said he knew how many steps were in his house because he had to count the steps to be like, dang, I got to go like up all these steps. And he said that um, it's hard to live a good life when you're sick. And most people don't think about that if they're not sick because they're living this basically, I'm going to say good life because you can get up when you want to. You can go where you want to. You can grab that glass. You can cook. You can do most things as far as using your body. But when you can't use your body, that's when people really start to develop this appreciation of what they could do but can't do. And like, man, I took all of that for granted. So I, I found out a long time ago, it's important to really find just the regular things throughout your day to be thankful for and talk to God about that and thank him for that because you will get into this place of not appreciating just the simple things in life, uh, which births dissatisfaction, which yeah. causes you not to give God praise for anything. And that's a very dangerous and sad place to be in. Okay. So I understand, because I think I missed it. What's the correlation between the old and the young? Younger people, you're at your peak health. So yeah. you're not experiencing. Okay. You don't think about it. Yes. You just, okay. You live in life thinking you like got all the time in the world. Mm -hmm. um, whereas when you're older, you start to get all these complications, not because God isn't good or that the devil's attacking you. The body's just breaking down. Um, and it's going to do that. And it's just like, man, I really got this body and I wish I had a different one. <laughs> yeah. No, and this is the thing. Like, there, was a, there was a saying that I heard years back. Um, that that the the weakness or the 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 gap of the youth is the thought of invincibility but the but the weakness of the old is the thought of frailty meaning when you are young there is nothing in your mind that you cannot do and even if you give pause to it it's i can recover from it but as you begin to age, to what Tremiko is talking about, all of a sudden, consequences, actions, responses, results, they start to get a little bit more immediate. Yep. Right? So we can use as simple as something like when I was young, I used to jump off everything I could jump off. I had young knees, <laughs> as, my, as my dad would say. Young knees. Now, <laughs> Yep. Oh, now we can. Yeah, go ahead, Carly. Oh, okay. Yeah, the age thing. Yes, I can. I can uh, relate to that. When I was younger, I could. I would see some of the older people, and I'm like, oh, when I get that age, I'm still be moving like I'm moving now. <laughs> and I'm at that age, and it's like, okay, it's it's like a little slower than what I used to. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so, yes. For sure. But I still appreciate and just thank God even for 
um, 58 years, mm -hmm. you know, because it's still truly a blessing. I probably can't move like I used to, but I'm thankful for that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, just like a few years ago when uh, teens and young adults went to the trampoline park, I was like, I'm going to watch. Because I know at my age, I'm not about to jump. Because like you, that recovery time, you, you think about yeah. stuff when you get, how long is it going to take me to recover? Nope, I ain't got time to be sitting back, icing, taking uh, bubble, but like baths with Epsom salt and yep. all that stuff. Trying to get right before Monday, yeah, exactly. man. I got to go to work. <laughs> no nah, man, yeah, you do. You think long and hard before you pretend. Like younger, you hop on roller coasters, no problem. Older, like no. Nah, I, I got two with me. I need my neck. <laughs> I That's need my it. back to work. So yeah, it's yeah. You you start to think about what you can do and what you can't do, and it's interesting because younger people, because I I hang around a lot of younger people, and it's like I think some of y'all now starting to get old and starting to get it, but. And it's just like, what do you mean, Miko, you young, you can do this? And I'm like, look, my body and your body don't respond the same. I'm not doing that. So, yeah, you just, you don't know what you don't know until you get there. And it's just like, oh, now I see what my parents are talking about. Yeah. So, And this is the thing is, you know, the old saying that everybody knows as youth is wasted on the young. Because you don't have the experience and the wisdom that comes with age. To now be able to be like, if I had the body I had 50 years ago, but the mind that I have now, you're talking about a superhero. <laughs> right? Youth is wasted on the young. But there is, and this is, this is where it comes to what Tremigo was talking about, this, this, this consistent state of being in praise gives you contentment. Because now that I am getting older, I can have a greater appreciation of the things that I was able to do when I was young. But I also can still have that same appreciation of the things that I can do now that I'm old. There are, you know, yeah, I'm not as young and spry as I used to be, but I'm also a little bit more wise. So I can appreciate context a little more in my 30s than I could when I was 18. Mm -hmm. So it's even if it's different stages, there's still so much to be grateful for. And now even with my children, Seeing that invincibility, especially with my son, who just, there is, there is nothing he won't jump off of. There is still beauty in the freedom that comes with, let's just be honest, that reckless nature of being young. Because there is, when you start to get older, and this is something that, that I've, I've spoken with my dad about, when you start to get older, your, your likeliness to risk starts to dwindle, mm -hmm. right? You start to get a little bit more conservative. And while that can be a good thing in some regard, it can be a bad thing. Especially when we talk about creativity and imagination. I know like Tremiko, she's taught about like that is, a, that is one of the main paths in which we experience and hear the voice of God. And that darn near by high school has been beaten out of you. <laughs> so there is, there is this, this aspect where we should be able to appreciate the innocence of ignorance. In some regards, not when it comes to the things of God, just in life ain't beating you down yet. And I can I can appreciate that. And I am so grateful for that to see it in my children, that they literally have no idea what the world is really like. And there is beauty into just seeing them see things and experience things for the first time in life. Like the other day, now that my son is become more becoming more aware, it was raining. And he literally, to what you just, it was like rainbow. And you're talking about just eyes of pure, just bewilderment of like, what is that thing in the sky? It's so beautiful. <laughs> and it's just like, for me, it's like, it's, it's a rainbow. And then the Lord reminded me. <laughs> Donna. <laughs> yeah, we actually did like respond that way, which brings up a good point. Yeah. We were just like, oh, it's seen And that. I was like, oh. But to your Thank point, you, Jesus. How do we explain that to him? <laughs> Two, now, thank you, Lord, we should have explained to him what it meant because he's starting. The fact that he understood that it was a rainbow, he said rainbow. Yeah. We should have. Yeah, but it goes oh, into that. 30. Exactly. It goes into like, I'm in my 30s, he's two. Yeah. <laughs> like, I've seen a bunch of them. Like, yeah. get in the car, we gotta go. <laughs> Oh my God. I know I didn't, uh, but that's what I'm saying. To be known. But that's <laughs> so, the perspective, and this is to what Chimiko was talking about, and what we were talking about with you know when we go to our chiropractor and the tell me something good. It is getting your mindset out of 
the just the everyday grind that it is to be alive and still having a heart in a position of praise to be like, yeah, I'm busy, but I'm about to take this 60 seconds to say, Lord, thank you for this rainbow. And even and this goes to a perspective, right? Because I thank you, Lord, because he just brought it to my memory, my uh, my memory. Having a conversation on Friday, like my mom, it was either Friday, was it Friday? It might have been Friday or Thursday. My mom called and she was talking about the weather and how ugly it is because it's raining and it's thunderstorm storm and it's gray. And I'm like, yeah, it's really ugly outside. That's one perspective. But another perspective could be that life comes through rain. The, the, the trees don't grow, the grass don't grow, the, plant, the plants, the vegetables, <laughs> none of that happens without rain. But so, if you don't have nothing that you need the rain for, you exactly. Don't appreciate it. I don't live, we live in Michigan. I don't live in California. We ain't got no right. This well, just changing the perspective. But well, you also yeah, gardening. I got yeah. gardening. Like Actually, Andrew got the farm rain. stuff. Yeah. So people who have like because it makes our farms and grass greener. Because yeah. I have no problem with the rain, but I was saying like my mom. But I'm just saying certain people can yeah. appreciate it more. Oh, than okay. Yeah, I I like rain because I get my best sleep on a rainy night, but. I understand the perspective my mom was coming up and coming from like especially we Michiganders and Midwesterners know around this time we counting the days in which we not gonna see the sun no more. <laughs> so uh, the gray of a rainstorm early September is an impending of oh snap it's about to be dark by three o'clock now, right? But to your point, that's just one perspective to have. But a better perspective would be to Lord, I, the rain the rain is necessary, and and this is where we, when we're talking about privilege, and that word annoys so many people, but privilege is the absence of having to worry about it. Rain, for people who live in the Midwest, we don't have to worry about drought. We don't experience that. Now, if we were living in Nevada, Arizona, Colorado, Oklahoma, we having a different conversation. Where rain, is, it hasn't rained for five months straight. <laughs> We're on a water advisory warning. You can't take showers. You gotta. You can't water your grass because we literally are experiencing a drought. That's like you said. Like I'm not thinking about rain like that. When it rains outside, it's just like, oh, cool. I'm about to throw on some chicken noodle soup, get in front of the TV, and we about to just have a, have a chill day inside. But as for someone else, for a farmer, for example, rain is. I'm not gonna lose this year's harvest. <laughs> And so we, that's what we have to do when we're talking about being in a praise state. It's being in the perspective of everything that God does is great. And there is something in everything that I can give him praise for. The rainbow, as Chimico pointed out. The rain. I might not need it today, but I know somebody out here on the West Coast, if they're getting rain, they are very grateful for it. Sure, I like to eat organic vegetables. As of right now, you still need the rain to get those. Now, I know they messing around with stuff in the lab, but as of today, <laughs> the grapes that me and Elias like to eat, <laughs> if the rain don't hit, we talk about a shortage, right? So there, there is a perspective to have where you're just, and that's what I said, it's not really that hard when you just, when you, when you settle down yeah. and just, and just look. And you, you ain't got to look far. You ain't got to look hard. You ain't got to look deep. It's, it is right there in front of you to be like, look, like, shoot. Most of us drive, if not every day, multiple times during the week. How many car accidents have you passed by just this week? From fender benders to full-on collisions. And you go and you look and like, oh, Lord, protect them. And, you, <laughs> and then you put your head forward and you keep driving, not even thinking when did that happen? Was I five minutes away? Was I ten minutes away? Was I in my driveway just pulling out? Did I miss that by a split second? Had I made that turn to get off at 75 instead of 76? Could that have been me? And I'm not saying, you know, you don't want to live your life like that either. But the point being is that it's not hard to find things to be grateful for. And that, and that, is, where, that is where we have to make sure that we stay in that in that presence of heart is that God is worthy of praise and I don't have to dig to find something to say thankful to say thank you for on a, on an every day every hour situation like it should be on my mind and on my mouth in giving praise and, and singing songs of praise and hymns of praise because he's just that good man and and it just comes down to 
do you appreciate the little things in your life if 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 the only things you can appreciate God for are the milestone events you missing out on a lot yeah. on a whole lot because you're privileged and you're taking it for granted and I don't know if it was you who said this to me, Shamiko, from a video you watched or someone else, but they were just like, if you're in a position in your life to complain, you are privileged. Yeah. <laughs> because only people who got the things that they ain't got to worry about complain. Because yeah. when you ain't got it, you ain't got time to complain. Yeah, you too busy trying to... <laughs> you out here trying to happened, get it. Yeah. <laughs> and even um, there have been times just when I'm out, like the Lord literally has said to me, Shamiko, just stop, slow down. Yeah. Look around. Like, look at all the stuff that I made. Like, you just not paying any attention. So, it could even be that simple as when you're out maybe taking a walk or taking a drive. When it comes to the different kinds of trees, the different color trees. Look at the birds in the air. Look at the colors on the birds. Or even sometimes I don't like spiders. But, like, one day the Lord was like, but just look at the pattern on that spider. And it's just like... Dana, that is awesome. Switch! Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I got to get rid of it. But, um, but yeah, I mean, just, like, simple. And that's the thing, like you said earlier, we try to go big with, okay, what, what can I give him, like, praise for? But nobody can make a tree. You, can, you can't make a tree. Only God can make a tree. And the only way that you can get another tree is by planting a seed. But that you can't make a seed to make a tree. So it's like really stopping to think about like only God make, could make something like this. And we don't even take time to like think like that. Like, dang, like even though we got all these scientists in labs doing stuff, nobody can produce or make what you made from scratch. Nobody can do that. So when you really stop and think about like, just look at the clouds or look at the sky or just appreciate all the different things that came from him, whether you prefer it or not. Everything is needed that he put in the earth. And if we just really slow down, yep. because especially us city folks, which you hear a lot from people who live like in the country and places rural like that. Areas, rural areas. Yeah. Rural areas. They like, y'all city folks, y'all too busy. Y'all got your mind on all, like five million different things and it and that is the case like we're always i know me my mind is always on a go 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 okay what can i do next okay after i do this what can i do here like i'll try to fit a million things in a day and i literally will do that i did that yesterday but then it's just kind of like well if you're so busy sometimes and you're not taking time to really stop and appreciate what's around you again that's how you can start to get into this mode of dissatisfaction not being content so I'm talking to me too. We all need to kind of take moments where we can just, when we're, you know, not busy with other things, just kind of slow down and look around and see what you can find to thank God for, because it's right there. Yeah, and that and that that those periods of reflection are so necessary because she, Jamie absolutely right. Most of us are are moving at 100 miles per hour on every single day to try to get that day's list done and probably thinking way too much about tomorrow than we should be right of what i gotta do tomorrow what can i move in today from tomorrow instead of just being like you know i got 50 percent of my, my 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 week's to-do list done today i can take i can take a moment to chill out i can take a moment to relax i can take a moment to reflect and be thankful and be grateful and be appreciative and breathe because if you don't have those moments, that discontentment, what happens is, and this is, this is why I said we have to be, we have to live in this state. It's a lifestyle because the way our minds work, it is harder to be in contentment than it is to be in discontent. Because everything that the world shows and everything that the media we consume and social media and we're so interconnected, there is something on a daily basis telling you what you do not have. And so if you are not taking the moment to reflect on what you do, where God has brought you from, what he has done, you will think about, well, you know, I ain't got that house I wanted yet. I don't have this. And then I saw on Instagram that she had that. And I saw on Facebook or on Twitter or on whatever. And I don't have those things. And I need those things. And that's where that, that discontentment and that bitterness and that resentfulness creeps into your life. And, and people think it's like this... this huge like landslide 
how bitterness and resentfulness and discontentment happens. And, it, and it's not, it's a trinkle. It's a, tr- it's a drop that all of a sudden becomes steady. It's, it's a small seed that gets rooted, but you don't see until the top of the weed is above the hedges. And you think, oh, let me just take this out. But there's a deep root. <laughs> And it's just going to keep coming back. And it's going to keep coming back stronger. And all of a sudden, one weed turns into ten. And where is this coming from? Because you let it take root. And so, like, I was listening to a podcast uh, a while back. And they had 50 Cent um, on for a guest. And for those who don't know, 50 Cent, is, he's a, is he still rapping? He was a rapper when I was younger. I don't know if he's still rapping. But he was talking about the difference between, like, poor people. And like people who aren't poor, so he wasn't necessarily going like poor rich. He's like people know you either poor or you ain't. <laughs> and he was just like he's like I never met a depressed poor person. And the host was like, what are you talking about? You know, depression and mental health awareness. And he's like, man, growing up, he's like in the hood, depression was not a thing. Exactly. <laughs> and, he was, and he was like, well, explain that. And he was like, because people had to get it. He's like, you feeling sad today? You not gonna go to work? Rent due next week? What you gonna do? Like he he wasn't saying like people didn't experience what he was saying was I didn't see it because folks was like life gotta keep going. The world don't stop because I don't feel good today. And he's like the problem with this generation is they're they've been removed from poverty. And so now, once you're going back to that position of privilege. You ain't got nothing but time to think about you being depressed and you not feeling well and you need to take three personal days off from week from work to get your mind to get because you ain't hungry. <laughs> you not living paycheck to paycheck. Your bills ain't going unpaid. And so that's what he was saying. He's like, when I was growing up, he's like, my parents, I never saw depression in my parents. I never saw depression in my friends. Now they was doing illegal stuff, but he was still saying, you don't fear, so you're not gonna hit the block. Because if you don't, you don't get paid. You don't get paid, you and your kids don't eat. There, there's this trickle effect. And it comes to the point of what I took from it is, once again, if you have space to complain, if you have space to be discontent, you got too much time on your hands. And that in and of itself, regardless of how you want to put, put it, is a blessing. If you got time and space to complain, you are blessed. Yeah, when you are in a space where it's either have a survival mentality or not, when you have a survivor mentality, all of your mental capacity is focused yep. on living. So there's no rule. Yeah, do you wish you had more than you got? Bl- yeah, but you don't have time, like you say, to sit back and start to ponder, well, dang. So it's too many people not in this. And I hate to say it that way, survivor mentality, but survivor mentality keeps you living. It's too many people that is in this victim mindset, and that's what takes you out. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, and that's, and that's the thing. Like Now it just seems like mental health issues are like things people want. Like, everybody is depressed. Everybody has anxiety. And I'm like, you got too much time on your hands. Way too much time. It it is clear that once you are in a position, somebody paying your bills. (laughs) You are in a position of privilege. Because I'm going to tell you, to what Jamiko was talking about, that, that survivor instinct that if I don't, if I take today off, that is a meal out of my mouth. I don't have time to sit. Doesn't mean I never think about it. I don't have time to dwell yeah. and, and just keep replaying it and repeating it over my head and getting depressed and anxious. And I ain't got time to do that. And you had people that didn't have much that were in the survivor mentality still trying to help other people yeah. in their neighborhood, on their block. Uh, and I was like, wow, how do you how do you do it? Like I told you, this, this is a woman that was working the custodial. She's not there now because she probably has just had her seventh child. But she had she had seven kids of her own now because she just gave birth, and then she had three that she took on from a relative. So in total, I think she got about ten kids, and she don't make a lot of money. And 
like she ain't depressed and all of it. I'm just like, how do you keep going? You know, but what I, what was I getting ready to say? I was about to say, um, oh my God, I should have said it when it was on my brain. If it comes back, I'll say it. But um, I think what I was gonna say, I don't know. I'll say it when because I don't know what I was gonna say. Yeah. So to to that point, right? It's even when you are going through something, there is still a ton to be grateful for. E- grateful for even in moments of difficulty. Oh. And like, and that's I think what you know the podcast I was listening. To, that was Fifty Cent's like overall point. Right, that of course he doesn't understand the spiritual ramifications behind it. In the sense of, if you got time to put your mind on all of these things, then you clearly are in a good enough position where you can, and that's a blessing. Uh, What I was gonna say is, be careful, um, because someone threw this out, which I fully believe. When the world pushes something, you have to be very careful, because the world is highly pushing. Everybody go see a therapist. Just go. It's good for you mentally. X, Y, Z. And even like, um, I don't watch TV. I watch YouTube. But there is, and I think they're still doing it. They have YouTubers highly pushing therapy, X, Y, Z. But then someone made the point that from a spiritual perspective, you have to understand what's going on is that they can use that against you later to say there's something mentally wrong with you, to say you're crazy, X, Y, Z. So now if they want to take your kids from you, Oh, well, you go see therapists. She has a history. Yeah, um, she has a history or he has a history of this. Like, they're going to use that against you. But I need to get something on you to now flip it to use it against you. And, you know, that's I'm just like, first of all, as Christians, why do you need a therapist when you have God? And then to go back and not to say that people weren't dealing with things, but they they came through. So go to go through slavery. They didn't give every slave a counselor. All right, let's 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 go through your mental stuff to make sure you're healthy enough to get in these cotton fields. Again, it's a survivor mentality. Y'all, we got to get through. And this was, they were, husbands were experiencing the master coming in, having sex with their wife. She got pregnant. Now she having this other man's baby. And he had to just accept that. And then you got the kids being stolen and the family being ripped apart and the names being changed. And all, like, that stuff will drive you crazy. And they did not go crazy. So it's just like you can you can make it you can press through but if you play the victim mentality of I need this which is where the world number one Satan is working to dumb down the world yep. doing an excellent job of that now he's getting everybody in therapy it's like he's building this whole portfolio so now when the time comes I'm gonna use all of this against you because you got a record of all these different things so I'm just throwing that out there be careful with all this therapy stuff because they definitely going to turn it against you. Yeah. And it's and even so, it's replacing God. Definitely. And that's where we have to get back to. <clears throat> and this is why this is so important, this conversation about an intimate relationship with God is because are you going to him? Are you giving him your cares? Are you letting him deal with with the trauma of your experiences, the unforgiveness that you may be battling with. Is God your therapist? Because that's that's what why they tell me you to go to therapy, right? The the hidden the message that hides the agenda. Well you need to help somebody to give you a framework of how to work through these issues and identify what triggers you. You know who can do that? God. (laughs) But you know what was really interesting? Because Satan will always give a portion of the truth but he always will mix it with a lot there was a therapist and he literally said he said it more than once he said therapy cannot cure you therapy cannot and I'm just like oh my god like he literally Satan literally has his man telling you this is not going to help you but guess what everybody still do I need to go schedule a a session well if y'all as therapists already know this is not curing anybody and helping anybody what's the point why are you pushing this because it's an agenda yeah. that they're using. And that's what I'm saying. Like, do you want to be do you want to be cured? Exactly. Or do you want to be medicated? Exactly. And and to me that that is a dramatic difference with God. Like I said, do you want this to stop being an issue in your life? Yep. Or do you want to have to go through these mental exercises of, okay, here comes the trigger, let me count to ten, take deep breaths, let me put it in the proper context. Who got time for that? <laughs> Who has time for that? 
When I can just go to the Lord through the prescribed way, through the Holy Spirit, give him the, Lord, this is what I'm dealing with. This is the trauma that I experienced in my life and let him heal and cure my heart. So when I go the next day, that doesn't even, it don't even come to my mind. Right? You know, like, you know what? Two years ago, I would have been on you. But I've forgiven you and myself and I moved on. But this is, once again, it comes from having a relationship with the Lord. And so many people don't have an intimate relationship with him. They, they know of him, but they do not know him. And, it, and, you have, and this is where it's just so insidious. Meaning that, that the, 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 the evil and the wickedness of Satan is so subtle. Is that it literally it has infiltrated the church. And I, I'm just, be, I'm not talking, I'm talking about the body of Christ. You have, there are cancers that we need to cut out where that they're pushing these, all these different ungodly agendas under the premise of this is what Jesus would want. This is what Jesus would need. We need to heal the trauma of history and decades through therapy and you need to go talk to somebody. It's okay that you pray. You should go get therapy too. And it's just like, well, what's the point of praying? Yeah. If I still need to go to therapy. So you're telling me prayer don't work. You, to me, I'm like, you can't try to, you can't have it, bo- you can't have it both ways. One has to work. And if you're telling me that even though I'm saying to pray, still go to therapy, well, prayer must not work. Because why would I need the other? But we won't, we don't have enough brave spiritual leaders to stand up and say that and be like, this is a trick of the enemy. And it comes from, we have, we now have a society of discontent. Nobody is giving God praise and appreciation on a consistent basis. All we see on a given day is everything that we lack. Everything that we want and we do not have. Literally, you wake up, you got fridge, you got food in your fridge, roof over your head, utilities working, you got internet, you, you got almost every streaming channel you can want. You may, you may can't buy everything you want, but you can treat yourself every now and again. You can go get a nice steak dinner every now and again. And all you talk about still is, well, I don't have this yet, and I don't have that yet, and I want that, but I don't see that coming. And, and it's just like, my God. Do we really think, and I'm just going to say it, everything you, just because you want something don't mean you're going to get it. And quite frankly, the problem with my generation, and, and, and I can say that because I'm a part of it, is not only do we think we are going to get everything we want, we think we deserve everything we want. Do you know how arrogant that is? I'm not saying that people don't deserve to have, to make a living wage and, and to have a relatively safe Life where you can raise a family, pay your bills. Da, da, da. I'm not saying that. But everybody's not going to be millionaires. Everybody's not going to be out here in a mansion. Everybody's not going to be out here flying in private jets. And quite frankly, a lot of y'all not willing to put in the work to get that. So no, you don't deserve it. <laughs> you don't want to work that hard. Because the people who have those things, once again, outside of the spiritual stuff that we can talk about, they all still work a ton. You see the entrepreneur that has the 15,000 square foot at the house house that you want in the mansion? He got to go to work. You, you're not going to get a 15,000 square foot house without a college degree working at Starbucks. It's not going to happen. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with you working at Starbucks. But you need to have reasonable expectations. You, you can't say, I want to do the bare minimum. I just want a job that I can go to every day, but I want to live the lifestyle of an executive or a doctor or a lawyer of a surgeon of whatever that works 50 to 60 hours a week. Well, okay, come on, let's calculate the math on that. <laughs> that don't add up. But it is told, then this is where it comes from a spirit of contentment and, and having a relationship with the Lord is God. You know what? I know what I want in life. As long as I got a roof over my head, I got my day-to-day needs met, and I can go on vacation every other year, I'm perfectly content with that. But if you don't have 
a heart of praise and you don't think and re- take the time to think and reflect on those things, the Lord can't help you get into that position. To really be like, what is it that you really want out of life? Not what the world is telling you you should want out of life. Everybody's trying to be an influencer now. That comes with a lot of access. I, me, personally, I don't want people in my, my personal business like that. That's part of it. You can't be an influencer and not open your door. Once again, it, the, the, the mental gymnastics. I want a million followers on Instagram and be able to be an influencer and have brand deals, but I post once every six months. <laughs> I don't think that's how it works. Right? Man, I want to be the next great YouTube content creator. But I don't feel like doing it. <laughs> it's not going to work. It's not going to work. And once again, it's totally fine if you don't want to do the work. But you can't not want to do the work and but want the results and expectations that come from those who do the work. So, praise God. For what he's done in your life, praise God for the position and and the access that you have and where you currently are and sitting in that position. And through that, you can start having honest conversations. We talked about honesty last week with like, God, you know me better than I know myself. In my mind, this is what I want to do. And the Lord is going to be like, well, in your heart, you do not want that <laughs> because you don't like this. You don't like to do this. You don't want to do this. You like to dedicate your time to these things. But to get that, you're going to have to dedicate your time to those things. And you don't find enjoyment for those things. He knows us. And so many people pursue things in life because it's attached to, the, to getting the things that we don't have. That we think we want because the world has told you this is the lifestyle that you should attribute to, you should ascribe to. Big house, fancy car, private community, gated community, million dollars a year, flying private jets. This, this is the life. It's the perfect Instagram, Snapchat, snapshot that everybody has. This is what you should want to live towards to. We should just want to live towards whatever God has for us. And having honest conversations with the Lord. If you want to become a corporate attorney, you want to become a doctor, you want to become a rocket scientist, you want to become an entrepreneur, whatever. I, there's, God is not going to be like, I am against you for having desires for your life. <laughs> That's not how he works. What he's saying is, your desires, let's line up to my will for your life. Because I know you. I know what's good for you. I know what's bad for you. I was Years ago, I had a conversation with a, with a friend of mine who's, who's much older, a friend and mentor. And after college, he had the opportunity. So he played basketball in college. But he wasn't good enough, he wasn't good enough to go pro in the NBA. But he got an opportunity to go play internationally. Still professional basketball player. Still would have been making good money, right? Just not NBA. But his dad, giving wisdom only a dad can give, was like, I don't think that's good for you. And now, him being a young man, how dare you? This is my dream. You know, I have an opportunity to do something that many people don't have an opportunity for. And his dad was like, I'm not telling you not to do it. You asked me my, my thoughts on it. I don't think that's good for you. So, granted, to this person, to, the, to, the, to this man's own discipline, because he was Holy Ghost filled, baptized in the name of Jesus, he didn't just react. He said, you know what? I'm going to at least pray about it. And what he told me is the Lord told him the same thing. If you do this, I will lose you. Because from his perspective, he was saying, like, Lord, I could be your advocate in these international areas. I could... Preach the gospel while playing sports, and God was like, no. "That's nice in theory." <laughs> <Is that a question? laughs> Not about to happen, right? Like that's yeah, that's nice in theory. That's a nice little picture you put on the fridge. It is good in theory, and so many people make decisions on things that that's good in theory. Everything goes right. Everything goes perfect. That is exactly how I want it. But what the Lord told him is. You struggle with lust. 
Uh, right? What? You have a woman here that you proposed to. So you're you you're already have a fiance that's gonna stay here while you overseas. Still a professional athlete overseas. And you struggle with lust overseas. I'm gonna lose you. Not in the sense because God is gonna just release you. Right. You're going to walk away from me because as we talked about last week, you are weak. In your mind, you think you about to go over there and be the next Paul. <laughs> you gonna be over there as David Bathsheba. Because okay. <laughs> you can't keep your ass to yourself. Yeah. That's in you right now. We haven't, I haven't been able to get that out of you. We're still developing that aspect of your character. You go over there, it's gone. So what did he do? He turned down the opportunity. Because in his mind, for God I live, for God I die. I say that I'm serving him. I need to be obedient to his will. Did he think about, well, if I don't do it, what I'm going to lose, what I'm not going to have, the chance to make money playing the sport that I love? No, what he thought about is if I do do it. I'll lose my relationship with God. And, and I'm not naive enough to think that I simply can just come back. That I won't get out there and get stuck out there. That, that happens to so many people. Mm-hmm. Think they, they, they just about to go outside the will of God and play for a little bit and then just come back. Like Satan about to just let you walk out <laughs> and not try his best to get you entrapped. And so he made the decision and he turned that down. And when I was talking to him, we were having this conversation. There was not a, I can honestly say, there was not an ounce of discontentment. He didn't didn't think about the money he lost out of because he didn't go pro. He thought about everything he has now. A wife that loves him. A family that loves him. Children that he's been able to raise to be God-fearing and worshiping the Lord and pursuing Jesus in his heart which he would have never had. And that's the mindset that we have to have. We got to stop looking at things from the world's view of what don't I have right now. But take a a position, a heart posture of praise and appreciation for what God has done. Not what he ain't done yet. And then and too many times and we got to get out of that that praise and worship testimony situation too where that's what everybody talks about is like, give him praise for what he's going to do. No. (laughs) Praise him for what he's done. We think enough about the future. We think too much about what we don't have yet. We think about too much what we're planning towards. Praise him for today. What has he done today? What has he done up until this point? And that is enough. That is enough. And I'll close on this. One of the things that really put help put life in perspective is an older woman that I had a conversation with a few years back as I was, I was trying to, I was truly making this transition to where I was pursuing God. And she, she's known me since I was a child, like a young child. And I forgot what happened. I think um, I had just gotten, I had just got my, that's what, I just had gotten my uh, full-time offer. And, you know, I posted the news on Facebook and it was just like, like, cool, like, all my hard work is paid off. Da, da, da. And everybody in the comments was, like, praising God. And was like, go out, like, the Lord is so good. Like, he's so worthy. He's so faithful. And at this moment, once I'm just now starting to make this transition, but I'm still not fully there. I got upset. Because I was like, uh, I did the work. <laughs> took those exams. I got those grades. I went and killed the internship. Not thinking about the fact that the Lord put me in a position to get them grades. Put me in a position to pass them tests. Put me in a position to get that internship. I was thinking about me. And so what the older woman said when I was sharing with her, because she was just like, because I was like angry and she was just like, what, are, what is going on? Like, what? This is a time of celebration. Like, why are you upset? And I was just like, yo, they keep giving out. They're not giving me credit for what I did. And she was like, you? <laughs> and she was just like she's like I'm not going to sit here and say that you didn't work hard but she was like your hard work is in response to the opportunity that the Lord put you in 
Now you deserve credit for taking advantage of it because there are a lot of people who are put in positions and don't, but don't get it twisted. <laughs> don't think that you did this without him. And she went on to say, and this really put things in perspective. She was like, Donovan, the point that you are in your life, if the Lord never did anything else for you, you still will have so much to be grateful for. And when I thought about it, she was absolutely right. Because by that point, I'm 21 going on 22. So not a lot of years under my belt. But I knew up until that point what God had delivered me from, what he had brought me through, what he had done for me and my family. And she was absolutely right. If from 22 until the day I die, the Lord was like, I'm not doing nothing else. I still would have so much to be grateful for. Now, I'm not saying I don't want the Lord to do nothing else for me. Right. But this is the mindset that we need to get into in that the Lord has done more than enough. He has done <laughs> great things. And we, we really need to make sure that he, he is simply worthy of the praise. It is not he needs to earn my praise. He already did. Point blank, period. For every single one of us, the moment that God manifested himself as flesh and walked on this earth and died in our place, he earned our praise. There is Nothing else has to happen. But this is why God is so great. He didn't just call it done and been like, all right, y'all on y'all. He's still there. He's still being faithful, protecting us, providing for us. And for all those things, he is worthy of praise. So next week, we're going to continue talking about praise and how our praise to him is a response to his faithfulness. So before we close out, any last minute thoughts, questions, or comments? All right. Well, Lord, we just thank you uh, for a great conversation and discussion. Lord, we thank you for the questions and the statements that came forth to give us better insight of God and insight, God, into you as we talk about praise and how grateful and appreciative that we are of you in our lives and how we should continue to walk down um, that path and make it a lifestyle, make it a, a heart posture that we come before you with the necessary praise and thanksgiving and appreciation in our hearts, our minds that proceed out of our mouth and not to take you for granted and the things that you do for us for granted, even even the simple things um, that we don't give much thought to. So, Lord, we just pray right now that everyone on the sound of my voice, that they would go on to enjoy the rest of their weekend, those who are traveling, that they would get to their destination safely. And we give you all the glory and honor that is due to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.